Okay, let's get started with the second video for this week. Uh, so I just want to remind us what we talked about last time a little bit, just briefly. So we talked about the concept of a planar graph. So here's an example of a graph that is planar. It does not, this is not a planar drawing of the graph, but it is a planar graph because there is a way to draw it in the plane without edges crossing. And here's an example of a way to do that. Uh, and then we talked about different concepts related to these, um, which were uh, the main one being the idea of a face. Uh, so in a planar drawing, you split the plane into regions. Each of these regions are called faces. Uh, in this case, we have four faces, F1, F2, F3, and F4. F4 is the outer face. Uh, the degrees is the number of edges in a boundary walk. Here we have three, 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 and one, two, three. So this one has all its faces, degree three. Uh, and then there's this nice relationship that said in a graph, um, the number of vertices in a connected planar graph the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces in a particular planar drawing is always equal to two. And we can verify this for this graph. Um, here we have four vertices. Uh, this graph is complete on four vertices as six edges, and we have four faces, and indeed four minus six plus four is two. Okay, so today we're gonna finally see um, how to build inequalities that helps certify whether or not certain graphs are planar. Okay, and the first one is a really interesting one that comes as a consequence of Euler's theorem or Euler's, Euler's formula. And I just wanna remind ourselves, this thing here is called Euler's formula. Okay, so, the statement is if G is a connected planar graph with at least three vertices and it has E edges, then you're forced to have this following a relationship that E is less than or equal to three V minus six. Now, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you have a bunch of vertices, <coughs> V vertices in total, it makes sense that there should be a bound on the number of edges you can put. I mean, too many edges make it complicated to draw a graph in the plane without edges crossing. But let's see the consequence of this with two particular graphs. I'm gonna start with K5. K5 is a complete graph on five vertices. So in this particular graph, we have five vertices and we have actually 10 edges. You can see that here, one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, so three V minus six is three times five minus six, which is a nine. And that is not greater than or equal to 10. So this graph is not planar, right? Let's think about why. If you're a connected planar graph, you must satisfy this inequality. So if K5 was a connected planar graph, it would satisfy this inequality, but it does not, right? E is 10, 3V minus 6 is 9. Now, if you think about this, this is actually beautiful. When we first introduced planar graphs, we tried to play around to figure out whether or not this one was planar, and we had many close attempts to drawing into plane without edges crossing, but we couldn't get there. And Trying really hard is not enough of a certification to say that it's impossible. There may be other weird reasons. You could draw edges in very strange ways. They don't have to be straight lines. They could be weird curves, which maybe makes this possible. But this inequality, which we'll prove in a while, um, certifies that that's not the case for this graph. Okay, let's try another graph. Let's try K33. So we'll recall what K33 is, is a complete bipartite graph with three parts on each side and every vertex is adjacent, every adjacent in one part, sorry, every vertex in one part 
is adjacent to every other vertex in the other part. So something like this. Okay, so this graph has six vertices and nine edges. So let's check this inequality. 3v minus 6 is 3 times the number of vertices minus 6. 18 minus 6, and that's 12. And that is greater than or equal to 9. And 9 is the number of edges. So in this case, this particular graph satisfies the inequality. Can we conclude then that this graph is planar? Actually, we can't from this. This statement says, if you're planar, you have to satisfy this. It doesn't say that if you satisfy this, you're planar, right? It only goes in the one direction. So planarity demands that this inequality is satisfied, but you could satisfy this inequality and still be not planar for some other strange reason. We'll eventually prove that this graph actually isn't planar by strengthening this inequality a little bit. We'll see that in a second. But first, let's actually give a proof as to why this inequality is true. And we'll see an application of it uh, in our problem a little bit later that tells us a little bit about um, impossibility of certain graphs being planar. Okay. So in the proof, we're going to take two situations. First, we're going to look at if G is a tree. So we have at least three vertices here. So if G is a tree, then we're going to write this 3V minus 6 in a little bit different way. We're going to take V minus 1. And then we're going to take 2v minus 5, which is the amount that's left over. Now, since g is a tree on v vertices, it has v minus 1 edges. Right? So this actually is e since g is a tree. And here we have at least three vertices. So this is actually greater than zero since V is at least three. So putting this together, we have this is at least E. Right? It's um, exactly E plus whatever this leftover is. Okay. Now you might be thinking why separate the situation where T, G is a tree? We'll see in a second that um, if G is not a tree, uh, you can do something to get uh, better bounds. So if G is not a tree, then I'm going to make a statement that we actually technically can't prove with the tools in this course, but you can kind of see is going to be the case. Then each face in a planar drawing of G bounds a cycle. Okay, well, what does that even mean, bounds a cycle? Well, like I mentioned, um, we won't be able to prove this statement, um, but we'll have a sense of uh, how to go about the proof. Um, let me just move some things here so we have more space, though. Okay, so we won't be able to prove the statement, but we'll be able to get um, or, or we'll use this fact to get some bounds. Let me just draw some pictures to give you a sense of what I mean, though. So let's say you had a planar graph that looked like this. I'm going to draw it a little bit lighter. So here's a planar drawing of a planar graph. Maybe I'll even make it a little bit more expansive here. Okay, uh, so 
you notice there's four faces. And each face has sort of a cycle in it. Actually, let me actually put, uh, just to make this sufficiently complicated, I'll even add something like this. So this face here, for example, has a cycle on its boundary. And this one, if you take a boundary walk, you have to start and end of the same vertex. So you don't get a cycle, you get a closed walk, but there is a cycle within that. And that's true regardless. So for example, if you go on the outer face, you'll get a more complicated boundary walk, but there's a cycle within it somewhere, right? Okay, what that means then is that the degree of each face is at least the number of edges in a cycle. And cycles always have three edges in them at least, right? Um, so we have a bound on the degrees of the faces. So every face in a planar drawing of G has degree at least three. Okay. Okay, so let's label the faces. We'll say let F1, F2, up to F sub little f, there's little f many of these faces, um, be faces in a planar drawing of G. Then by the handshake lemma, the face version, we get an inequality or an, an equality. Twice E is the sum of the degrees of the faces. Now we just said that the degree of every face is at least three. So this entire huge sum is at least three times the number of faces. Now, our goal is to get a relationship between the number of edges and the number of vertices. Here, it looks like we have something in terms of faces, but by Euler's formula, we can rearrange to get that this is, the number of faces is the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus two. That's Euler's formula right over here that related vertices, edges, and faces in a planar graph, in a planar drawing of a planar graph. And so that's 3e minus 3v plus 6. And so if we rearrange this, right, the key parts here are 2e is greater than or equal to all of this stuff. So we can move the 2e over here, and then all of this stuff over on the other side and this will give us E is less than or equal to 3V minus 6, which is exactly the inequality that we wanted. Okay, this is great. This is like one way to rule out that a particular um, graph is not planar. Now there's something actually even more interesting about this argument, which is that you can strengthen it if you look at the way that we proved it. So here, our argument effectively was that twice the number of edges is the sum of the degrees of the faces, and each face has degree at least three. So if you know that your particular graph has a particular lower bound on the degrees of the faces. Maybe, for example, all the degrees have at least of, of all the faces of degree at least five. Then you can say this is actually greater than equal to five f rather than three f. And it'll turn out if you do something like that, um, you'll get a stronger inequality, meaning that this upper bound here will be lower, which makes restricts the number of edges you can have if you're planar even further. And that's the next result we have here. 
So let G be a connected planar graph with V vertices, V greater than equal to three vertices in E edges. Let K be greater than equal to one, be the length of the smallest cycle in G. If G is planar, then E is going to be less than or equal to K over K minus two times the quantity V minus two. So I want to think about this inequality because it just looks random, um, but there are some things to say about it. So first of all, let's see what happens when k is 3. So the smallest length of a cycle is 3. Well, 3 is the smallest length you can have of any cycle. Um, so if the smallest length of the cycle was 3, then you would get e is less than or equal to 3 over 3 minus 2. That's 3 times the quantity v minus 2, which is 3v minus 6. And that's our previous inequality. Okay, if k is slightly larger, what happens to this? Well, this function right over here um, actually decreases as k increases. Right, so I'll make a note of that here. Um, as k gets larger, k over k minus 2 gets smaller. If you want to see explicitly why, you can actually write this as uh, 1 minus 2 over k minus 2. Right? And so as you keep making k larger, this fraction will get uh, smaller and smaller. So actually, this is a plus, not a minus. Sorry. Right? So, uh, you know, if you clear denominators, you get k minus 2 over k minus 2, and add 2, you get k. So as you make k larger, this denominator gets larger, and so this thing gets smaller. So this gets even tighter. Okay, so it rules out more possible classes of graphs um, in that light. So let's actually look at uh, the, gen the idea of a proof. I'm going to say proof sketch. Right, so uh, the idea then is uh, do... Well, same same proof as previous theorem with the inequality 2e greater than or equal to 3f replaced by 2e now is greater than or equal to kf. K is the length of the smallest cycle in this graph, right? Um, and so here, when we add the degrees of the vertices, that's twice the edge set by the handshake lemma's face version. These are all now greater than or equal to K. So this is going to be at least KF. So then what happens? We get 2E is greater than or equal to... Uh, k times uh, the quantity that we get from Euler's formula, which is e minus v plus 2. And that gives us ke minus kv plus 2. Right. OK, so moving things to a side, um, we have uh, K minus, I like this, KE minus 2E over here. And then on this uh, other side, oh, this is 2K, my apologies. On this other side, we have uh, KV minus 2K, right? And so the rest comes from factoring here, right? So we get... Uh, K times the quantity V minus 2 is less than or equal to E times the quantity K minus 2. And so uh, K over K minus 2 is, apologies, times V minus 2 is greater than or equal to E. Okay, um, so the key here now is to ensure... Uh, that this 
bound um, actually helps in deducing that some graphs that were planar or, or that are not planar can be certified to be not planar in cases maybe that we couldn't over here. So let's actually look at this example, K33, and see what happens. So we revisit K33. So again, K33 looks like this. Now we have additional information about K33. Um, K33 is bipartite. And we dedicated a big chunk of one class to prove that bipartite graphs don't have odd cycles. Okay, if it has no odd cycles, then it can't have any cycles with three vertices in them. So every cycle has length at least four. Okay, so if you had a planar drawing of it, um, so if K33 was planar, Um, every face in a planar drawing would have degree at least four. Okay. So by the theorem above, then E would be greater, less than or equal to um, four over four minus two times V minus two, which is twice the quantity V minus two. So you notice this is already a stronger, tight, a tighter version of the previous thing. The previous thing was E is less than equal to three times the quantity V minus two. So let's check, does this actually work? But there's nine edges. And there's six vertices, so this quantity here is eight. So this is actually violated. So this thing is not planar. So it's kind of fascinating, it's nice. It's sort of, I think one of the things that I really like about this is that you started with an inequality that didn't have this parameter K and you investigated the actual proof of it and you noticed that the crux of the proof came down to this fact that each face had a cycle and each cycle has a degree at least three. So if you know a lower bound on cycle sizes, you can increase this to a better bound and justify that K33, for example, is not planar when you couldn't have done it using the original inequality. Okay, very cool. So now we have these two examples of graphs that are not planar, K5 and K33. Okay, how can you certify other graphs that are not planar? Well, we can do this following. Um, so, let G be a graph. A graph H is called a subdivision of G if it is obtained from G by, this is very informal, and this whole entire page is going to be informal, but it's going to give you a sense of how to uh, characterize graphs that are planar. Um, so it is obtained by um, inserting vertices along edges of G. Okay, what does that mean? So I'm gonna actually put this here. So this is an informal slide. 
Meaning you're not going to be tested on this, but it just gives you a sense of how to, of a different way to recognize graphs that are planar or not planar. Okay, so for example, if I had a graph like this, so there's G. Now I make a copy of G and along edges of G, I put some extra vertices. So I say this is informal because you know, we don't talk about graphs geometrically, but it's something like this. Right. So the word subdivision sort of, sort of sounds like you subdivide something. So this is the idea you subdivide. Now you notice this graph here looks awfully more complicated than this one because it has a lot more vertices and a lot more edges. Right, you can actually redraw it if you wanted as something like a, like a, eight cycle and then like a edge between uh, two sort of opposing vertices. Right. Okay. Now you notice. Uh, if your original graph is planar, then any subdivision is planar. Right, because uh, a way to draw the subdivision is to just take your original graph and place the vertices on the, the edges in the way that you did to justify the subdivision. So um, G planar implies any subdivision of G planar. In that light, in an opposite direction, this is equivalent logically to saying that um, if a subdivision of G is not planar, then G is not planar. Okay. So one thing that's really cool is there's this theorem that's quite complicated that we don't cover in this course that gives a full characterization of graphs that are planar. And it says a graph is planar if and only if it does not contain a subdivision of K through three or K five. So these two graphs, K33 that, and K5 that we certified are not planar, are actually special. So we know part of this. For example, um, if you have K33 or K5 as a subdivision, or if you have a subdivision of them, that is a subgraph of your graph, then you can't be planar. Right? Because if you have a subdivision that's not planar, you're not planar itself. So we do have one direction. Um, if G has a subgraph H that is a subdivision of K5 or K33, then H is not planar. And you can't have a planar graph that's a subgraph. You can't have a graph H that's not planar inside of a graph that is planar, right? Um, so G is not planar. The hard part is service certifying that that's it.
there are some other weird obstructions. And this direction is actually very, very, very long, right? Um, it would take several classes to prove something like this. So we won't be doing it. Usually it's about like five, six classes to prove that direction, but it's cool to know, right? It's nice to know that these things that we got as our inequality, our obstructions through these inequalities are pretty much at the core of what is required for a graph to be planar or not. Okay. So like I said, this is informal, but this is cool general knowledge to know. You're allowed to use it. Feel free to use it if you like. Um, you won't necessarily need to. But now I wanna look at some consequences of all of the things that we've talked about um, with planar graphs. One regarding inequalities and one um, looking at uh, using Euler's formula to determine something interesting. Okay, so the first one has to do with the idea of a complement of a graph. So let G be a graph. The complement of G is usually denoted like this, is the graph on the same vertex set as G, but where if UV is an edge of the graph, then UV is not an edge of the original graph. So what you're doing with the complement is, um, maybe I'll draw this in gray because it's not part of the solution to the problem we're going to pose. Um, so if you have a graph G that looks like this, for instance, then its complement is the graph on the same vertex set. But where anytime you see an edge between two vertices, you don't see it in the complement and vice versa. So these two will have an edge between them. These two will, these two will, and these two will, and these two will, and that's it. Right? Every time we have an edge here, we don't see an edge here. Every time we see an edge here, we don't see it in the complement. Okay, so this problem says, let n be greater than equal to 11, prove it's impossible for g, for a graph g on n vertices and its complement to both be connected in planar graphs. So the intuition behind this is, if you have a connected planar graph um, and it has a certain number of vertices and not many edges, then its complement will have a lot of edges because together they have all possible edges um, in a graph on that set of vertices. And if you have too many edges, it's hard to be planar. Okay, so let's write a solution or attempt at a solution. So suppose For contradiction, or maybe I'll even word it this way. Um, let G and G complement. I'll say let G be a connected. planar graph on n vertices and suppose the complement is also connected in planar. Okay, um, so we have an inequality that is demanded by each of these. Um, then, the number of edges in G, it has n vertices. It has to be less than or equal to 3n minus 6. This is by our first inequality today. And G prime is, sorry, G bar is complement also has the same number of vertices as G. If it's also connected in planar, it also has to satisfy this inequality as well. But we actually have a formula for the number of edges in G and G complement combined. Since every pair of vertices is adjacent in exactly one of the graphs, 
when you put the two graphs together, informally speaking, you'll get the complete graph on, um, on n vertices. So I say, but since uv is an edge of the complement, if and only if, or precisely when uv is not an edge of g, uh, the number of edges in g plus the number of edges in its complement is going to be less than or or is going to be actually equal to the number of edges in a complete graph on n vertices. And we proved in multiple ways that this quantity is n times n minus 1 over 2. So you can take a look at your notes from when we uh, talked about the handshake lemma to actually see that this is the case. Okay, so if we put these together, let me call this set of inequalities 1 and this two here we have an upper bound on this an upper bound on this and then we know exactly what their sum is so we can put this together and say um, from one and two if these are both connected planar graphs we're going to have that the quantity n times n minus one over two is less than or equal to, so this quantity is the sum of these, and that's less than or equal to the sum of these two, which is 6n minus 12. Okay, so now we need to do some algebra with this. If we multiply by 2 and multiply out the binomial, we'll get this here. Right, or in other words, n squared minus 13n plus 24 is less than or equal to zero. And so now the question is, now this sort of goes way beyond um, stuff to do with graph theory. Um, the question is, when do you know that this inequality will be satisfied? And it turns out this will be satisfied precisely when n is less than or equal to 10. You can kind of see if n gets too large, then this thing can't possibly be negative because you'll have this being too large. Right? But there are lots of other ways to see this. I'm not going to um, uh, give formal ideas. Um, but I'll say this is true. When less n is less than or equal to 10. Okay. Okay, so I did omit some of this algebraic part over here. But the key here is using these inequalities together with the information we have about the individual graphs to give this quantitative thing that says if both a graph and its complement were connected in planar, then the number of vertices has to be at most 10. So if the number of vertices is at least 11, one of them must be uh, not both connected in planar. Okay, the last example I want to talk about today is actually a really fascinating example that tells you a little bit something about soccer balls. So the statement is the following, let G be a I'm going to say connected planar graph. And suppose all the following are true. In any planar drawing of G, the faces have degree 5 or 6. And G is a 3 regular graph itself. So every vertex is degree 3. Prove no matter what, the number of degree 5 faces is forced to be 12. Exactly 12. So why do I mention soccer balls? Well, if you look at a soccer ball, you can think about a skin of a soccer ball to actually be a planar graph. 
And if you take any soccer ball, you can Google an image of a soccer ball now if you don't have one anywhere near you. That graph looks like it has a bunch of hexagons and pentagons. The hexagons are usually colored white and the pentagons are usually colored black. And no matter what, you'll always have exactly 12 pentagons, regardless of how many hexagons you have. So let's see why this is the case using some graph theory. So we know the faces have degree five or six, so I'm going to give those names. So we'll say let G have V vertices, E edges, F faces, P of which have degree five, and H of which have degree six in a planar drawing. So let's collect some information here based on the scenario that we're given. Well, first of all, by the handshake lemma, the regular handshake lemma, every vertex has degree three. So twice the number of edges is supposed to be the sum of the degrees of the vertices, but every vertex has degree three, so this is three times v. Okay, so I'll call that equation one. Okay, so every, if we use the handshake lemma face version, um, actually I'm gonna wait for that. Uh, so the next thing I'm gonna say is, the faces are all degree five or degree six, right? So all faces are degree five or six. So um, the number of faces in total is the number of degree five faces plus the number of degree six faces. Okay, so we'll call that equation two. Now we can use two to get uh, a different formula for the for using the face version of the handshake lemma. So by the face version of the handshake lemma, um, this number of total uh, twice the number of edges is the sum of the degrees of the faces. But we have faces of degree five. The number of them is P. And so the sum of the degrees of the degree five faces is 5P. Each one of the P degree five faces has degree five. So that's care to take care of those. And then similarly, the sum of the degrees of the degree six faces is six H. Okay. And then finally, we have uh, Euler's formula. So by Euler, we have V minus E plus F is equal to uh, two. So you notice there's all of these equations and all of these unknowns. And the surprising and interesting thing is it turns out that if you play with these equations, one, two, three, and four, you will end up being forced to have P being exactly 12. Okay, so let's see if we can see why. So if we look at one and two, 
Combining those together, uh, we get that 3v is 5p plus 6h. Okay, but from four, if we actually take four and multiply it um, by six, we get six V minus six E plus six F is 12. Okay, but what is 6f? By number 2, 6f is 6p plus 6h. So we can write this as 6p plus 6h. Okay, um, but we have some other information here that uh, helps us in this scenario. Right. So, for example, this quantity here by 1 and 2 is 10p plus 12h. Okay, um, but this quantity here minus 6e by equation 3, uh, equation 3 itself is uh, minus 10p and, or minus 15p, sorry. And uh, minus 18h. Okay, so now we can take our uh, pen and start erasing things. We have a 12h, 6h, and then minus 18h, that cancels all the h's away. All right, and then we have a 10p, a 6p, and a 15p subtracted. That all leaves you with a p. And so you get exactly that p is 12. This is kind of a fascinating argument that really hinges on all of this. If you didn't follow the quick calculations that happen here, it doesn't matter. You could plug this into any algebra solver and ask it to solve, and it'll solve and find out that p is 12, even though the number of uh, faces of degree 6 might vary. So I think it's really these two examples that give you a sense of the uh, possible ubiquity and use of all the stuff that we've built up. You can be able to sort of quantify that you can't have too many edges in one graph and then too many uh, edges in one graph that sort of complements another um, while both maintaining planarity through the use of these inequalities that we built. And then also you're able to tally together all of these uh, pieces of information about planar graphs uh, in order to say something very concrete about the number of phases of a certain kind.